Would uh, actually rather watch the video than listen to Dan talk. <laughs> well, unfortunately, you can't stop Dan from talking, no matter how hard you try. Believe me, I, I know this quite well. Particularly two or three in the morning after a bunch of shots of tequila, you just wind him up and let him go. But for those of you that don't know Dan, which I can't imagine that you would, uh, Dan Kaminsky is a good friend of TourCon. He's actually top of our buddy list. So. Um, and uh, he's been talking with TourCon for a long time, actually. We're particularly pleased that he's a solid presenter with us. He always takes the time out to be here for TourCon. And he's going to be talking on his uh, Black Ops with, I guess, Pattern Recognition, the TourCon remix. So let's give a big hand for uh, Dan Kaminsky. And if you need any more, my friend, right there. You're, you're a sick bastard, Zane. Hi. So, we're here to break stuff. Cool. Um, my name's Dan Kaminsky. I've done like a couple books, worked at a couple companies, broke some stuff. That's about all that matters. Um, you know, I'm really supposed to change uh, what it says at the top of these slides. But yeah, it's gold mix. I suck. <laughs> Oh, the, the, the drinks are coming. Um, so there are actually times where I'll talk about a single subject like DNS and I'll just focus on DNS like a laser and just totally stay on that one topic. N no, no, not this year. This year's all about um, um, ADD is useful. You get to work on like eight things at once and then go ahead and present at the same con. So we've got lots of things to talk about. Uh, we're going to talk about network neutrality. We're going to talk about what happens when you do yet another massive internet scan and Ah, find two million SSL servers. Um, we're going to talk about online banking. There's a really trivial hack against most online banking systems, actually specifically 27% of the top 50. Um, it's just depressing that this hack exists, but potential solution for it. I kind of sort of did some patching to open SSH a few years back that kind of sort of left us on there. Um, so I'm going to do a really hideous fix to fix that. But the big thing, of course, pattern recognition. Let's make some entropy recognizable. Humans are pattern recognition engines. It's kind of what we do. Um, the degree to which we're using our human abilities for pattern recognition to actually go after code is, um, let's just say, a field that could be expanded. Um, and thus, achieving my, uh, my grand goal of pretty, pretty picture. So, let's begin. Oh yeah, uh, speaking of pretty pictures, um, yes, you can diff two files visually, visual bin diff. And I'll tell you, show you how to do that later. Okay, so we had to talk about network neutrality. You guys are a pretty cool crowd. I'm not gonna go into too much of the uh, politics. Suffice it to say, um, telcos are looking at traffic and going, well, we can't make more money making the network faster. Maybe we can make more money making the network slower. Um, yeah, there's this great quote from Comcast. To accommodate the needs of our customers who do choose to operate VPN, Comcast offers the Comcast at home professional product. This product will cost $95 a month. Uh, I don't want to spend 1100 bucks a VPN into work. Thank you very much. It works fine just right now. So how do we actually find stuff that's going nasty against uh, neutrality? Uh, in terms of definitions, network neutrality is all about your ISP taking a look at the traffic you're moving and uh, applying different qualities of um, packet transmission based on whether they actually want the packet to route or not. Um, there's an interesting question. How do you know if your quality of service is being degraded? So um, I was working on something totally different. Just a random little TCP stunt. I like TCP IP. I like messing with it. and. Um, I sort of realized we could start using this for network neutrality. All right, so here's the stunt, right? 
Um, TCP, standard mechanism for communicating between point A to point B with a reliable stream of packets, a reliable stream of data. Um, TCP automatically determines the amount of available bandwidth between any two points. Um, there is no communication between all the various users of the same line. What happens is when the line has too much traffic, it just drops some on the floor. And TCP's job is to detect packets being dropped on the floor and slow down. If it doesn't slow down, if no one slows down, then the line becomes useless and that sucks. Um, see video on internet. So. Um, <laughs> Dropped packets on the internet are actually a source of information about not just your own session, but about other things that are going on on the channel. Um, and so what you can actually do is, um, well, so here's, here's the concept. TCP line, figure if TCP determines that a given, a given end to end, hang on, let me think this out for a second. All right, you're talking with someone in Finland. They're um, not one hop away. You've got maybe 15 hops between you and Finland. What TCP is able to do is figure out, hmm, if I send packets at one kilobyte a second, will they get all the way there? Great. 10K, great. 20K, great. 25K, no. There's a certain amount of available from one point to an end that is basically the, you, you get the, it's the weakest chain thing, right? The, the, the maximum amount of bandwidth along the link you know, is, is constrained by the slowest link. So what you do is, I'm, re I'm not saying I'm hungover from last night. <laughs> I'm totally hungover from last night. Or maybe I'm like pre-hungover for tonight. <laughs> oh man. Maybe I should actually put back on the pirate baby thing and go sleep under the table for a bit. Okay. All right. I can do this. Professional. All right. So, um, TCP tells you that you can only send traffic at five kilobytes a second. It tries to send it faster, packets drop. So what do you do? You send packets faster than five kilobytes a second. But damn, you say, this will cause packets to drop. Yes, it will. If those packets make it all the way to the hop with the constrained bandwidth. You send 5K a second on your TCP stream. Now you start sending more traffic. On a separate, completely separate session, you start sending another 10K a second but you only let it go one hop. Will it cause any traffic to drop? No, not unless the weakest hot link was between you and one hop away. So you are now sending 15K a second out of your ethernet port, but only 5K a second all the way through the internet. One hop, that's still gonna make it. Two hops, three hops, four hops, five hops, ah, five hops. Now you've hit, suppose you've hit the hop with the constrained bandwidth. At five hops per second, TCP had detected you had 15K, of capacity, you are sending, wait, TCP I detected you had 15, TCP detected 5K of capacity, you're sending 15. What happens? Packets drop. So what's interesting here is um, you're seeing this feedback on your TCP session. It is being caused by something in the TCP session. It is being caused by you sending this additional traffic. You know which hop is getting that additional traffic, and you know that it is causing failures because you're seeing it in your TCP session. What if we start injecting traffic from different locations? What if we start injecting a bunch of traffic from different IP addresses? So I have a TCP session going on, and YouTube tries to send a whole bunch more data. Will there be different reactions than if CNN starts sending a bunch of extra data? Will there be different reactions if it's a bunch of encrypted data? How do you actually do this? What does this actually look like? So this is, you know, new slide for TourCon, rock on. This is how you actually do this. What we're gonna do is we're going to go to our random number generator. We're going to monitor how much data we can get through it. We're gonna pipe it into SSH, because if you know me, everything has to work through SSH. And what we're going to do is we're going to see how fast can I send traffic to this particular host, you know, just normal. Actually, this is... Okay. So I've got some session going on. 
and I'm basically filling, TCP has detected a 380, 380K point, 380.3 kilobytes per second average stream. That's how much can be pushed. I have achieved TCP saturation. TCP has said if I send it any faster, things are going to die. I start sending another 100K a second. I only let it go five hops. It's still going at you know, 380, 390. Now I let it go 14 hops, and it down the original session. So HPing is a very flexible tool. I can go ahead and, using the dash A flag, change my source. Using the dash P flag, change my port. Using the dash capital E flag, change the file content. So essentially, I can inject a whole bunch of additional traffic and see, is it causing the drop from 390 to 188? This is actually useful if you're trying to figure out what, basically what you're doing is you're figuring out the network is defining as interference. And in, in defining what the network is defining as interference, you're able to figure out what is a, um, you know, what its standards are in terms of neutrality. If YouTube can get more packets through, but CNN can't, then the network is biased towards YouTube, which is actually the point I was trying to make a while ago. Um, here's a bit of a stunt. What if you want, um, so this requires saturating a line with TCP packets. Um, maybe you don't want to do full network saturation. Maybe there's a problem with that. Um, maybe you want to get better data, you know, uh, performance status, what's the jitter, what's the, you know, latency on set packets. This is more detailed information that you can extract using the method I just described. So let me tell you what I'm actually working on. This is, I think, the first public time I'm talking about it. It turns out, I know this is shocking, Windows Media Player actually has more code in it than just DRM. I had no idea. <laughs> That's all they're talking about. But no, there's actually like a full-on video infrastructure in there. So check this out. Um, this echo is getting a little bit to me. OK. So Windows Media Player, when you're sending video, and real media does the same thing. I think QuickTime has an RTP mode as well. Um, when it's sending you video, it just does a unicast UDP stream. It just fires video packets at you. Now, what's saying earlier that if you just fire packets out, then you know, you, you're just going to cause bandwidth overload and you know, there's no feedback and you don't know that you're actually overloading the network and all those kind of good things. Um, well, yes, that will all happen. And that is why we have uh, another protocol called RTCP, which actually sends back jitter information and bandwidth information and allows the media playing infrastructure to figure out how much bandwidth is available. Um, there's actually nothing that forces, this is kind of fun. There's nothing that forces the RTP stream, the RTCP stream that says quality, to go back to the same IP address that appears to be sending video. So we can have packets that appear to be coming from YouTube, appear to be coming from CNN, appear to be coming from all these places around the internet, and we're sending back performance data to Dan Kaminsky. Cool. So, um, no, really, I'm kind of putting these guys on notice. Um, if you're doing nasty things to filter and to provide bias towards one or the other, I'm going to find you, I'm going to bust you. So please stop. <laughs> ah, now that we're done with that, SSL. So yeah, I have my big scanning box, and I threw it a while ago at, um, hmm, let's find every SSL server on the internet and say hi to it and collect its certificates. Um, I run this system called Deluvian. Um, it's actually really weird when you scan the internet now. Uh, it appears there's a bunch of firewalls out there with a little uh, mess with Kaminsky switch, and people are checking it off. <laughs> um, no, you can't just send a bunch of SINs and a whole bunch of IP addresses and expect that the boxes that speak back to you are actually there. Um, they lie a lot. Um, that being said, I've been trying to filter through the data I got back, and I've gotten some interesting things out of SSL servers. There are two basic rules for deploying SSL. SSL is supposed to give you a nice encrypted session. Um, first of all, on the public component of an SSL cert, do not put anything you would not want to actually be public. There's a reason it's called a public key. You would think this is obvious. Gee, no one's going to go out to every IP address and look at all the certs to see what's in them. Um, the other thing is you really can't put the same certificate boxes. 
That's because SSL doesn't have this one property called perfect forward secrecy. Um, if box A and box B had the same private key, they can read each other's traffic. Um, now this shouldn't be a problem because by crypto theory you never even generate, you never move private keys. You always generate a private key on the box that's going to use it. You know, bits are cheap as Bruce Schneier said. So um, this shouldn't be a problem either. No one would ever go out and look to make sure no one's been copying their keys all over the place. Actually, wait, we did that and totally found it. Um, speaking of that whole public key thing, <clears throat> if you are the sort of site that does not want people um, if you put out a honeypot, and this honeypot, its goal is to trick people into attacking it, you might not want to call it honeypot.yourcompany.com. But if you do, <laughs> you might want, want to put that in the SSL search. <laughs> it's kind of signed. Hi, I'm the honeypot. <laughs> yeah. Um, what about the other stuff in terms of uh, keys leaking all over the place? Well, here's what's good. 90% of the SSL keys that I found were actually on only one box, just like the spec said. Excellent. 10% um, of the keys were a little more widely deployed. Um, so widely deployed, in fact, about one out of three boxes on the internet that's hosting SSL actually has a unique key. This is called when things go bad, things go really, really bad. <laughs> There's like a whole bunch of VPN concentrators and embedded devices that, um, well, you buy one on eBay and then you can read all the traffic the other ones move. <laughs> um, <laughs> There's some groups that really should know better that have deployed like 10,000 machines or so. so um, if you work at this group, yes, I'm talking to you. Um, the absolute numbers are pretty sketchy, though. Like I said, there's a bunch of boxes that are messing with me. But um, there's a lot of devices out there that got sold. Um, to their credit, there's a couple companies that ha are doing things correctly. I can specifically say, you know, Cisco and HP both clearly have devices that, you know, they'll have the same template. But clearly, when the first time you boot up the machine, they actually generate at that time. So that's kind of nice. And you can just see it because they have the same template, but the keys are different. So Cisco and HP, at least for a couple of the devices, have done the right thing. Um, a couple other devices have very, very much not. Online banking. The world's most depressing Google search is why is this secure? How about instead of telling me why is this secure, how about you actually be secure? <laughs> Depressing, you know, like 26% of the top 50 banks, they do this. Um, uh, hi, I'm going to give this to you on a web page, and it's a username, password. Oh, excuse me. Here's your social security number from a couple sites. And they're not asking for it from a uh, SSL encrypted site. No, no, no. But they are putting down a GIF of a lock. <laughs> the incredible thing is, you know, they paid some absurd amount of money for this collection of pixels. Everyone does the same thing. It's hilarious. Um, why is this the case? Why aren't they? Uh, so the reason this is insecure, of course, to get any of these logins over HTTP, the idea is that they post to HTTPS. If there is no bad guy, you will indeed securely log into the website. In the absence of an attacker, you are safe. OK, in the absence of the attacker, you are already safe. The whole point of security is in the face of an attacker. Um, so why aren't they just encrypting every single connection to, their, to the bank website? Well, there are a few banks that do. Uh, Wells Fargo comes to mind. As soon as you go to wellsfargo.com, bam, you are instantly moved to an HTTPS site. Why doesn't every bank do this? Don't they have all the money in the world? Well, you know what? It is a pain in the ass. It is expensive. It is non, not very scalable to have every single access to your website come in over SSL. Security people believe that it is. We're wrong. It sucks. SSL hardware does not scale worth a, anything. Um, and so, that, so basically, uh, the perf guys say, you know what, we're just not going to have every, every link be SSL. Sorry. Um, there's another possibility, and this is done about 50% of the time. This is actually really common. Um, or what they do, actually, I need a clock on me because I was spending a little bit more time here. 12.48, I'm doing just fine then. 
So here's another option. There are a bunch of banks that do that. When you go to their home page, what they show you is not, here's your username, here's password. Instead, they say, please click here and we'll let you log in. We'll move you to a site now that will let you log in. This works. Lots of banks do it. Here's the problem. The UI guys veto it. They say if you don't give people a username and password prompt on every single page, either A, they don't know online banking exists, or B, they're not being told to go ahead and use it and stop calling us on the frickin' phone. Your bank does not want to talk to you. <laughs> they really, they want nothing to do with you. They want your money and they want you to come into their computers and tell them what to do with it. They don't want to talk to you because that's expensive. So. The UI people say, if we go ahead and we don't have this form on the front page, people aren't going to use online banking. We're going to have to spend more money talking to them on the phone. So the perf guys vetoed, always be secure with SSL. The UI guys vetoed, um, go into a second page. And so you have the third option, which is crap. <laughs> um, and the security guys lose. Um, Security people do actually lose if they don't be realistic about what's going on and uh, about what people's requirements are. So here's a question. Can we make everyone happy? Can the user interface guys be happy? Can the perf guys be happy? And shockingly enough, can security be happy too? The answer is yes. So here's what we're going to do. Web pages are not actually static. These are not, you know, like PDF, no, PDF's a bad example, but they're not like a sheet of paper. They're actually little programs. You can throw JavaScript in there. They can recode themselves in response to user input. Now, there's a mechanism in HTML called iframe, which is basically putting a mini window of another site inside of a page. Now, it's well known that you can use iframes to pre-cache an entire web page. Like, if you know click from page A to page B, while they're viewing page A, you can have a miniature iframe load up page B. So as soon as they click, it goes to the cache contents, pulls it out of the web cache. Great, wonderful. What wasn't very well realized is that you can actually put an SSL site into an iframe. So you go to a website, and it will, in the background, even though it's an HTTP link, it will, in the background, start up the SSL session, start downloading, start caching, all while you're browsing normally. You can actually do this. So here's what you do. Here's how you combine these two things. Conceivably, the username on a banking site is not particularly private information. If it is, then it shouldn't be in plain text. It should be X'd out in case you're you know, in some place and one can look over your shoulder. While the user is typing in their username, the web page can, because it's dynamic, because it's not static, because it can recode itself, the web page can actually go ahead and insert an iframe while typing in the username to receive the th that causes the page to start up the SSL session. And when the user goes to type in the password, they're just instantly moved over to SSL then. Now this has actually been implemented. The way it ends up looking is you type in your username, and as soon as you start typing, I have this iframe coming up over SSL from Yahoo. Yahoo is actually another site that messes this up. You, you know, the online banking guys I can understand because you know, tech really isn't their thing. Um, but come on, it's freaking Yahoo. <laughs> they, they should know better. So um, the idea is you need to log into something. You start typing in your username. As soon as ABCD went in, as soon as li actually literally I hit the first character, it spawned this iframe. And then the moment I go ahead to actually click on password, it actually doesn't let me insert any text. It goes, this is not a safe place for text to be inserted. It moves me over to SSL look like in code it's it's really straightforward it's just a form that has a you know on focus as soon as the password gets the focus it moves the location over to the HTTPS site it's actually fairly elegant so perf is happy UI is happy and dear god we're actually not being ridiculously insecure woot so as long as we're talking about bugs in crypto systems 2001 one of the things I found out is that uh, SSH can be used to do kind of a poor man's VPN. SSH is traditionally a system for getting a shell on a remote machine, a command prompt. Um, and they had a little bit of functionality that said, oh, if I've got some like web server running on here, or I've got an email server, we can do something called port forwarding. But I want you to say, when you do the initial connection, what all your port forwards are gonna be. And so people would have these horrible scripts and would try to map these things. It was such a pain in the ass to manage. And I was like, wouldn't it be nice 
if every time we needed a port forwarding, we could just say, okay, this time I wanted to go here, this time I wanted to go here. Well, it turns out there was a protocol already supported in all the web browsers and all the various tools called SOX. And SOX let you declare to SSH, hey, I'm going to connect to you know, the machine over there, and uh, I'm going to go ahead and connect on this port, and I want to go to Yahoo. I want to go to CNN. And I want it to work, you know, same connection, same syntax. In fact, I want it to be like I'm sitting on that network over there. And this is great, and this is wonderful, and there's a little tiny problem. You see, a few years after I did SSH, I did some DNS research. And DNS, of course, is what you use to convert from yahoo.com to some IP address. Well, when you're using SOX, at least SOX 4, what you do is locally, you say, hey, um, what is the number for Yahoo? And then you take that number and you remotely go over the SSH link and you, you go places. Um, what was it about earlier about being, you know, security when there is no attacker is not that useful. <laughs> uh, you want security when there is an attacker. Um, an attacker can actually, on the local link, hijack your outbound DNS. And even though your packets are going out over some foreign link, um, locally the bad guys can redirect how things go foreign. So uh, we need to get DNS to happen remotely. Um, about a year and a half ago, I got SSH to support the SOX 5 protocol, which does indeed involve getting the remote host to do, do all your addressing for you. The problem is, is that the browsers, uh, Mozilla does actually support SOX 5 through a hidden setting. Thank you. Um, Internet Explorer, not so much. We'll leave it at that. Um, is it possible for us, even for these clients that aren't supporting SOX 5, is it possible for us to suppress the leakage of DNS data? Yeah. So, SSH. Okay, so I was talking earlier about TCP, right? TCP being our standard way of doing a reliable communication from point A to point B with bandwidth and all the other stuff handled. Um, DNS does not go over TCP, normally. Normally, DNS goes over UDP. UDP is basically, I fire a packet and forget about it, and oh, maybe something will come back later. Um, you know, we could put a UDP to TCP translation layer in SSH that just handled DNS, and then, you know, write all this code, and then be a whole bunch of Or, it turns out, for various obscure reasons, DNS actually does run over TCP as well. It needs to get back a packet that says, um, yeah, I know you tried to do that over UDP, but no, no, you better retry that over TCP. So if you actually put up a fake server that sets what's called the truncation bit, and you have it respond to every request with the truncation bit set, your client stack will actually retry over TCP. And now you can go ahead and move DNS great. There is a, and this is a general purpose strategy. It works for SSH, it will work for Tor, it'll work for everything, it stops DNS leakage. There's a little bit of a problem. So in 2004, and so this is DNS over SSH. I already did SSH over DNS. That means I have DNS over SSH over DNS. Yes, I have finally implemented DNS over DNS. Malkovich, Malkovich, for committing such a sin. I believe this is um, <clears throat> Cinnamon Toast Crunch and Mickey's. I'm going to go crawl under this table. <laughs> Holy crap. Actually, it's pretty good now that I think about it. Yeah, you, you got to get that uh, cinnamon toast crunch aftertaste in. Then, then it's rocking. All right. Thanks to Zane Lackey. He thought I wouldn't. So, more bugs. More stuff with SSH. You log into a box. I haven't logged into this particular box before. And it says to you, hmm, I don't recognize the key fingerprint of this box. Do you recognize 099B199841772B8? What the hell? <laughs> Is there anyone in this room who's going to remember this? <laughs> really, I'll quiz you on it later. I, 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 will, uh, I will buy all your drinks for the night if you can remember that in three hours without writing it down right now. So, um, now according to the design for SSH, yeah, 
you are actually supposed to recognize this hideous blob of hex. Um, and you're supposed to reject it if it looks unfamiliar. I mean, I'm serious. They're, they will tell you this with a straight face. Um, so there's something called the uh, 2 billion SSH key attack. Uh, the hacking group ADM came up with it. And it's very simple. They generate 2 billion keys and spoof the key that looks the most similar. And it works like a freaking charm. We need something better. So funny little, started up, little uh, research field called crypto mnemonics. Why have I called it that? Because the name is awesome. So <laughs> crypto mnemonics. There are three, the study of remembering crazy crypto crap. All right, so there's three classes of human memory, uh, at least to the degree that's useful in cryptography. Rejection, I've never seen that before. Like, I've never seen 099B1, yes or no. Recognition, it's that one, not the other one. You know, like, you know, I've definitely been drinking that. Uh, <laughs> I should have been drinking that. <laughs> And then there's recollection. Let me describe to you the Mickeys and, and uh, I'm having trouble recollecting Cinnamon Toast Crunch. <laughs> uh, all right, so all SSH requires out of us for this particular use is rejection. All we need to be able to say is um, that string of hex is not what I, it's not the string of hex you're looking for. Um, hex is a total failure. So what else do we have available? Well, there have been some other attempts, uh, you know, using abstract art patterns. There's actually a really cool thing called pass faces that got used. Um, and the idea is, is that you would recognize, oh, yeah, it's um, this blob of pixels or, you know, that's sort of okay. But these faces, the face stuff actually works really well. We have uh, hardware acceleration to deal with uh, human faces. Um, great stuff. It actually is very interesting. You can get a very specific form of... Uh, uh, brain damage, and then you just can't recognize faces. Everyone looks like they have the same face. Um, that's that hardware dying, actually. Uh, the problem is that our, the amount of entropy we get out of these systems is pretty low. Let's say you have this grid of nine faces, and you have to match five of them. So you have to match the right face. I recognize that girl, and that girl, and that guy, that guy, that girl. Yeah, you only get like 59,000 possibilities there. That's less than 16 bits of entropy. This is fine, this is great for an online authentication system, which is, of course, what Passface is built. Um, it doesn't at all work for offline. So I couldn't go and you know, represent this sequence of characters as a bunch of faces and expect anything to work out of it. Um, it just wouldn't, it wouldn't work. Um, you know, that instead of making 2 billion SSH keys, I'm going to make 59,000. It's going to take too long. So we need better than that. Um, so humans don't remember arbitrary strings of characters effectively. We know this, right? Um, we do remember stories. Homer's Iliad has a ridiculous amount of entropy in it in terms of what we remember from these stories passed down through eras and eras and eras. Um, however, stories have a very unique element to them. They kind of sort of change over time. You know, things get added, things get removed, things get forgotten, things get inserted. The most stable element of a story are the names of the participants. Humans have a ridiculous amount of memory for human names. This is just, it's part of our acceleration. What if we turn these hideous sequence of bytes into a series of human names? So what I did, this is bizarre, but it does work, takes this data, notice that there's a little bit more unique female names and male names, Way more last names than either. And what we're going to do is we're going to take 512 male names, 1,024 female names, and 8,192 last names. That's going to be 9 bits of entropy, 10 bits of entropy, and 13 bits of entropy. Some 32 bits. We are going to pick these names according to names that are the most different as possible. Bob and Bobby are very similar. Remembering the difference between the two is kind of hard. Bob and Jim, much different. So what we want to do is we want to try to calculate the greatest differences between all the names because we want you to be able to recognize the difference between Bob and Jim. And what we're going to use is something, uh, as an edit distance metric, like Python's Levenstein algorithm. Or it's not from Python, but it's implemented in Python. And we're going to try to prevent two names from looking or sounding similar. And what we're going to do is we're going to take that big blob of hex and we're going to represent it 
as a series of names. And it will actually, this has actually been implemented. It ends up looking like that big blob you saw earlier became Julio and Epifania de Zudi, Luther and Roland Dornbos, Manuel and Twyla Imbessi. Now, you'd say, the, you know, this is a lot of names to remember. It turns out you don't have to like recollect them off the top of your head. You just need to see them and go, oh yeah, I've seen that name before. This works. You need to see them every single time. They can't just pop up like, oh, have you ever seen this before? And it's like, it's only showing up when there's a problem. No, you need to see it every time you log into a box. But if you see these names every time you log into a box, you actually start associating these people with the box you're trying to log into. It works. Excellent question. Um, here, grab a beer. <laughs> Dealing with order problems sucks. Um, what it's, what's interesting is I'm, I'm estimating about maybe eight, you know, eight to ten bits of rot from the fact that Julio might be at the top or might be at the bottom. Julio might actually be married to Roland instead of Epiphania, things like that. So there is actual potential for shuffling. Um, so I wouldn't want to see this for really, really, really short hashes. Um, the point is with hashing algorithms that you have so much extra capacity. Now, it is possible, and this is going off on a bit of a tangent, but it is an awesome question because it's totally what I've been looking at. It is possible to actually embed additional bits. So there'd be like, an, like a com yet another series of names that's just there to handle the fact that there's bit rot. Let's say there was a sixth couple that was added that was just basically a hash of the particular ordering to the rest. You'd have 160 bits, and then the fact that the human brain can shuffle them a bit, you add extra bits to compensate based on what we do or don't pay attention to. Um, that may actually be useful to do. Um, there, this is actually, this is also new for TourCon. Name-based passwords. Uh, how many people here have ever had to log in somewhere where you actually have to have password standards and they have to meet certain entropy requirements? Awesome. How many people here have ever had a password like lowercase a, lowercase l, seven, dollar sign, one, three, lowercase n, uppercase m? Okay, these are a pain in the ass. <laughs> um, you end up with things like 23 syllables and like you have to you know, describe them slowly and you know, there's typos and you're screwed. Oh yeah, 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 there's a bug in the slide, have a beer. <laughs> what if instead you typed Dirk and Kuk Kolopagil? Omar and Gina Heimel. Okay, so you're typing a heck of a lot more. You get more entropy, because in this case, in the, in the previous example, you had 48 bits of entropy. These two names give you 60. You have more entropy, less syllables to describe it, and you have the possibility for spell check while typing in a password. I'm not convinced this is gonna be a better way to log into systems, but if you actually have a high security environment that requires you to have 64 bits of entropy in your password, this may be a better way to do it. And the really cool thing is, this can be entirely client side. You could potentially map an arbitrary password, just your client will convert Dirk and Kook to seven, AL7 whatever. Go ahead. All right, I have a beer. Yes. That works well once. I have one beer left. Hell is the tax. Huh? Hell is the tax. No, no, it's not. But if you consider A through Z, lowercase, A through Z, uppercase, zero, 09, and a group of, um, what's it called? And a, and a group of the most common punctuation, you end up with about 64 combinations. So what you could do is you could, um, Basically, just write a mapping function between the characters that actually get used in passwords, even for secure passwords, and Dirk and Kuk Colopaggio. Then what you'd have is you'd have, say, one of the characters is basically an escape bit, where it's, hey, guess what? Some jackass used a piece of the password that we couldn't represent in the normal 64, and you know, here now we're going to put in the raw ASCII code. 
is, is that you take your arbitrary plain text password and you just map the characters to a sequence of bits, and then that sequence of bits gets remapped to um, names. Does that make sense? All right. Go ahead. We did something like this for uh, passwords that encrypted the hard drives. We actually then broke the tools that we forgot the passwords. We broke the tool based on the dictionary. If you go to the uh, attack our passwords, Mm. The problem with passphrases is their entropy sucks. You know, if you go ahead and, uh, you know, th so this, the idea is you're still taking 64 bits out of a random number generator. Passphrases, because English is incredibly patterned, right? So you got 1.3 on a passphrase, you basically are talking about sentences, meaning you only hit 1.3 characters per, 1.3 bits of entropy per character. So, I mean, that's the average for English. So let's say you have a 40 character passphrase. You're still only talking about 50 bits of entropy, 52-ish. Uh, Most passphrases aren't even 40 characters. Most of them that I've seen are something like 20. So you're talking like 30 bits. So your passphrase breaking was based on the fact that people select crappy passphrases. And the reason people select cra crappy passphrases is because that's all they can remember. Normal sentence recollection is pretty weak, just like talking about with storytelling. Our ability to remember the precise details of stories is pretty weak. But we have hardware acceleration for names. And so because you have hardware acceleration the theory, and this actually does require you know, a greater sample size than my head, um, <laughs> the theory is that, the, the, that our capacity should be much larger for these. Go ahead. There's actually a uh, site that I can't quite remember the full URL before, but it's called, called Diceware. Are they, they're, they're using um, uh, words out of dictionary as an entropy source, right? <coughs> Very interesting you bring that up. Um, how many people here go around saying um, uh, car, boat, Jack, Bob, Timmy? With the exception of Timmy. <laughs> the problem with diceware is humans don't go around saying random words. And so we don't have the actual mental connections set up to have us remember random sequences of words. Humans speak in sentences. We tell, you know, we converse. The only time we actually communicate in an element that has an enormous amount of entropy on a person is actually, um, is actually names. I mean, the, look, we have 32 bits of entropy contained in three names here. Now, you can go ahead and you, I, I submit to you, it is easier to remember Omar and Gina Heimel than it is to remember um, uh, Automobile, Timé, and uh, Fu. Am I wrong? Possibly. But my, my gut check is that we have more number names than we do to remember because there's no... With the, the, the interesting thing about this approach is that you're actually using existing knowledge bases. We know that people have to have people with a first name also have a last name. On another, on a slightly more culturally interesting level, we know that um, people tend to aggregate in terms of couples. Attack based on the pattern, uh, you know, the, the set of last names is always going to be you know, in, a, in a given position. Mm. So, the position is there shouldn't be. What do you mean? Uh, you've got a limited number of uh, male first names. They're always, you know, this, you know, Dirk is always going to be in a position where the male names are, right? Or, or, or do you mix them up? Oh, oh, oh. so the, the, the concept is a, it's a straight bit mapping. So you take your signal, 160 arbitrary bits. And in this case, you know, from SSH, we are talking about theoretic. It's coming out of a hash function. So they, they should be completely random. And then it's like a structure overlay. You take the nine bits, and it's like the first nine bits are always a male name. The next 10 bits are always a female name. The next 13 bits are always a last name. So because of that, the, the, the structure is there only for uh, us, basically. It's only for the fact that we were, you know. And in fact, that's actually an interesting observation. Uh, in cultures where last names come before first names, this would probably need to be reordered in some manner. Um, because there are actually 
many cultures, as far as I know, there are many cultures where you use your family name first. Um, and in those ones, you might want to actually flip the order around. But the actual order of names is just there to be compatible with the wet wear already in our heads. And this is awesome. These are the best questions I've had on this stuff. So thank you. Go on, continue. Similar last names or last names that, you know, just, you know, develop whole families. Mm. So this is actually an interesting thing. The census data is useful in that uh, we have a, uh, America ends up absorbing names from large numbers of regions. And so, I mean, if you look at the names that I got, it was basically, the, the only standard that I chose was, does this name not sound like that name? Um, in less, in environments where there's less entropy in names, this mechanism may not work as well. I make no pretending that this is a culturally sensitive representation system. The nice thing about being a geek is I don't actually need to worry about that. Oh, oh, now I'm doomed because I'm seeing Mike. <laughs> uh oh, hit me. From this, are we to believe that your stance is you believe a pastor is one man plus one woman? <laughs> 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 I'm using married couples to represent SSH keys. My belief in the sanctity of marriage is not actually high. <laughs> All right, we got anything else? All right, cool. What's up? What's that say? 15. 15 minutes? Oh, man, I'm going really slow. All right. So speaking of broken representation, oh, man, I'm going really slow here. All right. Speaking of broken representations of entropy, if you look at a hex dump of some crap, um, guess what? That's useless. It's just as useless here. As, you know, I'm going to use od-tx1. Just show me a file in bytes. It's like, well, it tells me I have a run of zeros. Thank you. Uh, that's not that useful. There's got to be a better way to represent the kind of complex signals that, let's be honest, we have to fuzz all the time now. Um, there are two ways we do fuzzing. Fuzzing being random changes to a file to try to find bugs in a parser. Um, one way is take a file, bits, see what happens. I have no idea what's going on. I know it's a file. I know I can flip some bits. The other is smart fuzzing. Take a file, understand all the crazy crap that's inside, fuzz the structure, and see what happens. The problem is, is that smart fuzzing works a lot better, but it requires smart people to drive it, and smart people are hard to find. Dumb fuzzing doesn't require any smart people. Unfortunately, dumb fuzzing is pretty dumb. There's a reason it's called dumb, because it's dumb. Um, can we increase the intelligence of fuzzers to some degree? Well, there's this thing that'll find structure in anything, and it's called sequitur. Sequitur is a linear time pattern finder. It creates co hierarchical, context-free grammars from arbitrary input. That's the geek description. The straightforward description is, hmm, here's some code. Switch statement, case one, value two, case two, value three, case three, value four, case four, value five. I think there's some repeated stuff in there. And there is, you know, we've got case, we've got value. So we're going to turn this into switch C, symbol A1, symbol B2, symbol A2, symbol B3. And this is going to basically take us from a sequence of bytes to a sequence of symbols. The algorithm that actually does this work is called sequitur. It was created by Craig Neville Manning as his PhD thesis about 10 years ago. Um, when I did this work, I did not realize he was the chief research scientist at Google. So that whole don't be evil thing, um, yeah, that's okay, I'll do it. Um, trivial algorithm. What we're going to do is we're going to compress, say, some arbitrary files. Uh, in this case, it's Win32 code. And we are going to look for patterns. Now, because this, it's a hierarchical pattern, so A could contain B, B can contain C, and so on, we are going to color each byte according to how many symbol depth, how far we had to go to recover each individual byte. And so what do we get? Now, the last time I did this talk, you couldn't see crap. What I did was I actually re, you know, took those images, which is just a hex dump. Each byte is colored by how deep I had to go to recover the byte, with it starting at blue and ending at white. Um, what you end up seeing is actual blobs form in the data as you have repeated sections that you constantly have to go the same amount of depth to recover. So with no knowledge, I'm actually finding structure offsets and structure forms. It's kind of nice. Um, can we 
for fun. Well, I'm creating a tool called the CFG9000. It's a little bit of a smarter dumb fuzzer. All right, so we've got these symbols here, right? And if you actually do a graph here, you get this really nice graph that's very nice and elegant. Um, what if instead of fuzzing at the level of individual characters, what if we fuzz at the level of symbols? So we're gonna turn, you know, having two cases, you know, CCC, ASE, we have case, case, case. You know, so we basically batch up the data by the amount of chunks that it took, you know, by, by the chunks that SecOrder finds. So that's what the CFG 9000 does. It gets you a bunch of symbols, it shuffles, it drops, it repeats, and so on. And um, what happens when you actually do this? Well, here's what you see when you run it on code. It actually finds that this P, P arrow rule is a symbol, and it'll go ahead and repeat it, or it'll go ahead and drop it. Can we run this on graphics formats? So I did try this like, hmm, I should actually go ahead and try this on some real images. And yeah, this thing's actually um, breaking JPEG. And it's breaking it in some way that is at least good enough for the parser to recognize there's something there, but bad enough that it's actually corrupting it in random and broken ways. So the mechanism actually is successful constructing valid but broken data. In other words, it'll still make it through the parser, but it won't look very good. To do, create a better version of SecOrder that's actually optimized for this stuff, eliminate redundant symbols. It's cool, but it's not where, yet where we need it. What do we actually, what's another approach? So, there's something called dot plots, right? Dot plots, I remembered actually from a completely different realm. There's a paper called Visualizing Music and Audio Similarity. It was done by a guy named John Foote over at Xerox. The basic idea is you split a song up into little tiny chunks and then you compare the chunks to each other and figure out if they sound the same. If they sound identical, you put down a white pixel. If they sound different, you put down a black one. So this was actually run on a track from the Beatles. And uh, yeah, this actually worked. Here's the intro, here's you know, the verses. And on the actual slide, I don't know how well you can see it up there, but the sections actually visually do, like when you see them, they look different as you tra traverse from the bridges to the verses and so on. So if this is finding structure in audio, of course, music being incredibly patterned. What about code? Can we do the same stuff there? So I ran this on the pirate baby MPEG that I was running at the beginning here. Anyone here know how hideous the MPEG format is? It's like header inside a header, inside a subsequence, inside of frame, inside a macro block. Oh, it's ridiculous. Um, I don't know MPEG that well. But you know what? I can certainly see header, header, header header. Each of these white blobs is a header, basically. And with no knowledge of the protocol, this is actually doing segmentation. So what exactly is happening here? You know, concrete terms. Let's take Shakespeare. To be or not to be. If you take to be or not to be, and you take it horizontally, you take the thing and you take it vertically. And you basically put a dot whenever the word is the same. Well, obviously you're getting this big diagonal line down here, just like big diagonal line down here. But you also get repeats, because the 2B at the beginning is repeated with the 2B at the end. And so you'll get a diagonal repeated. This is from John Hellman's paper, which is really, really good. So this stuff is actually, you know, I'm not just pulling it out as like, wow, this is for code. Turns out the bioinformatics guys were the first to really realize, hmm, we're looking at a file format even more hideous than what's coming out of your computer. We're looking at the human genome. Let's find some patterns in it. Um, they actually did a lot of this work first, but it turns out that it works really well on code. What could we possibly want out of these images? Well, without having to know anything about the file formats, we want to know section boundaries. I want to know, you know, I may not know anything about MPEG, but I know that this block that this sequence of bytes right here is different than this sequence of bytes down here. That there's a different statistical profile. That there's a different nature. And that if I'm gonna do fuzzing, I'm going to fuzz each of these blocks one at a time. Because I wanna reach different chunks of the underlying code, and the best way to do that is to break only one thing at a time. The other thing I'd like to do, of course, is to get some view of exactly what's going on. I mean, if I can look at a given pattern and say, oh, this looks like 
maybe I can get some more data. So what if I try this on various other file formats, like Java class files, like .NET assemblies, CNN's homepage, HTML being much more dense and much more um, internally repeating because HTML is so redundant, looks rather different than a .NET assembly. Packet traces. I look at file formats as basically, imagine you had a bunch of packets and couldn't tell where one stopped and another began. Come to file formats, they suck. x86 code. Like I told you, we can run this on chromosomes. Nintendo games. <laughs> okay, I know crap about 6502 assembly, but I can at least tell you, there's one thing here, there's one thing here, there's one thing here. So, I'm actually releasing a tool, it's called Hardcore, and um, it calculates these images. Kind of cool, IMAX style, you end up doing hacking at 100 megapixel. <laughs> Nothing says awesome like 100K pixels by 100K pixels. Fuck. Um, the global goal is clearly achieved. We can certainly separate a file out into individual subchunks. Can we figure out what's going on based on what those subchunks look like? Well, we know from the paper that I showed you earlier, there's all these various shapes that do show up in real data when you're looking at words. This is what the game was doing originally. Um, you know, you can find palindromatic sections, so you can find like, you know, this same thing as A, B, C, D, E, F, G, I, and then I, H, G, F, E, D, C, B, A. And then it shows up as a big X. Not much in there that describes this level of patterns. Um, I don't know what the hell's going on here. <laughs> But that's very interesting. It's very nice to have a tool that is showing you more complexity than you were prepared to parse. And all I can say is, this confused the heck out of me, but it confuses the heck out of me in a far different way than a random hex dump does. All hex dumps look the same to me. I'm not built to look at hex. But I can tell you, this is not this is not this. And in fact, I can tell you that this is from a font file format. And if I look at anything that looks like this, I will be able to say, that's a font, because it has that font effect going on. So that's actually kind of cool. There's a lot more research to do. Um, but this out. As a lark, I figured, you know, originally we're taking the same file and comparing it against itself. What if we took a file and compared it to an older version of itself? Well, now things aren't identical, but they're not actually different either. There's a lot of similarities. So before, because you know, the first block is always the same as the first block, the second block is always the same as the second block, you'd always have this hard diagonal line. Now, because it's different versions, it still shows up, but it moves around, it changes angle. Basically, you can visually trace out where things get inserted and where things get deleted based on where that previously solid line shows up. It works. I, I don't know if it should work, but it totally does. That's kind of fun. Um, and yeah, this is like the MS Visual Studio, um, Visual C runtime from 7.0 to 7.1. Mostly the same. I think there's some new code right there because there's a big old gap. New stuff. Um, well, color. Color is always good. Color is pretty pictures. Pretty pictures are kind of the goal. Um, it turns out there's a library out there called Simmetrics, and Simmetrics lets us go ahead and use all these various standards, a lot of them from the bioinformatics world, to get similarities. If you take one and put it in the red channel, another in the green channel, another in the blue channel, the standards will disagree, and thus you will get pretty, pretty pictures. Um, there's another hack that I did. This hack involves a new layout format, and this will be, I think, the last thing I have time to show you, calling it a tilt-shifted dot plot. Um, in a normal dot plot, X and Y are both the absolute value inside of a file. So you get basically all your information streaming diagonally. Most of our image viewers aren't really optimized for diagonal image display. Um, so what I created is a new thing called a tilt-shift dot plot. As you go down in the file, it's still, you know, you're still advancing throughout the file. But if you go horizontal, it's actually just looking back. Now, this view is actually interesting for two things. First of all, it's streamable. It'll actually show you, you know, you can stream data in. It'll go line by line as it's generated. And second, it's really, really compatible with, um, with existing viewers. So hang on a second. Let me, uh, all right, so let me pull, up, pull up an image here. I think it's in my documents, actually. Yeah, it is. All right. So... 
this is going to take a little while to load because it's, it's like 260 meg PNG. What could possibly go wrong? All right. So this is shell32.dll. This thing is enormous. I have no idea what kind of crap they've thrown in here. But um, <laughs> I actually know the guy. I should probably apologize to him for that. So I can actually scroll through this file, see all sorts of interesting internal structure. You say, oh, yeah, this is, you know, this is messy. This is probably code. And uh, <laughs> hang on a second. And whoa, we're including some other crap. <laughs> These patterns just show up. What do they, I don't necessarily know what they mean yet, but it is actually interesting to be able to see so much complexity inside of a file format and at least be able to get some new, some more meaningful representation of data than, say, hex dump, which is useless. So, in summary, um, network neutrality is under threat, but I'm working on it. Uh, check your SSL devices. Complain to your online banks if they have those really dumb forms. Um, uh, don't drink Mickey's and the Cinnamon Toast Crunch. Um, stop expecting your users to do anything with hex. It's mostly useless. Um, fuzz your file <laughs> formats, because we're breaking the crap out of everything. And I mean everything that isn't specifically tested against fuzzing. Um, oh, and take a look at your You might be surprised what you find. <sighs> That's what I got. And I actually ended on time. Uh, any questions? Go ahead. Obviously, some of this stuff really does have patterns, but I think the first slide you showed was kind of fuzzy uh, X, color X stuff. So here, here's our base standard, right? If it shows you a pattern out of that view random, I throw that. <laughs> so, I mean, that's the thing, right? If you know most code is actually happening. Because, I mean, I love how it works on So, most software is very pattern data. So, when things become interesting, are we actually finding anything in the bio or not? From what I know from the biologist, there is a fair amount of power. <laughs>